as you go on in the things of God, there's many questions that you start to, to ask and raise up within you. And the good thing about studying the Bible is you never reach a point where you know it all. There's always something new to learn in the things of God. You know, there's, there's things over the years that I've had to really seek the Lord on, and I continue to seek the Lord on, and that is in the areas of healing. Uh, we saw, um, we were on quite a large um, prayer team when we were in, at Brisbane in the big church over there, and uh, we saw a lot of strange things over there, praying for people. We pray this, the, the, our prayer with all that's within us. You know, we pray for this person and they get healed, totally healed of some disease that was life-threatening. Then we'd say the same prayer over somebody else and they'd die. And that would upset me. So I thought, well, work there. Why won't it work there? And so those sort of things I really started to try and seek. And I asked the Lord about some of these things. And when you start to inquire of people, it is quite, quite a shock in what people truly think in their heart. They say they want to be healed, but we had one lady that we prayed for that was very ill, and every time I went to pray for her, the Lord says, don't pray for her, she doesn't want to be healed. And that really confused me. I thought, well, anyone with any brain, even half a brain, would want to be healed, wouldn't they? <laughs> you know, well, why would you want to be in sickness? Are you there? You know, but people have different things going on in their mind. And after the third time, I, I had to challenge her. I said, "Well, I feel the Lord's telling me that you don't want to be healed." And she got very angry with me. She said, "Of course, I want to be healed." So I started praying again, and once again, the Lord said, "Say it to her again." So I said to her again, "The Lord tells me you don't really want to be healed." And all of a sudden, she just let it all in. She said, no, I don't want to be healed because if I get healed, my husband will leave me. Now, that's the sort of thing you've got to counsel first before you can get the breakthrough of that person being healed. And we saw other things too. We saw one person come forward for prayer and they're all ready, ready to get in. And, and he'd, been, uh, he'd been off work for a long time and he needed the hand of God to touch him, to bring him to that health, to get back to work. So we started to pray and he went, oh, hold on. Put on. He said, don't pray for full healing. I only want half a healing because I want to stay on the benefit. See, so these sort of things started to show me that it's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to bring you the word and then God will work those things out in people's minds. Another lady, I remember, that, um, came to this church and she was blind. And I knew... I felt more she was going blind and she was going to, um, according to the doctors, be, be totally blind. And that sort of thing is not acceptable in my heart, in, 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 my, in what the Word of God says. So we offered to pray for her. She said, oh, no, don't, don't you pray for me. She said, I don't want to be prayed for. I said, why is that? She said, I'll have to take my dog back. She had a sing eye dog. So, you know, you can... You can start to take responsibility, and a lot of people don't pray because they really don't think there's got any answers out there. Now, you may, you may, there's very remote chance of this, you may at one time in your Christian walk are angry with God. They won't ask for a show of hands because I don't want to put mine out. Now, so, <laughs> there's things that you cannot understand what goes on in a person's mind. So your responsibility as a Christian is to share, to encourage, and, and, and show them the Word, for the Word can set them free. Is that right? I mean, have, have you been totally sort of um, shocked sometimes where you hear of an evangelist comes to a place and he prays for all these people, they're unbelievers, they don't have, they even say they're unbelievers, oh, I don't believe in that stuff, and they get healed. You seen that? And you think, well, why are there so many Christians that are sick? If God's grace and God's mercy is there for us, then we should know how to tap into it. Do you believe that? Yes. Now, in the area of, of the, the evangelistic, when, when a great evangelist moved, and we've seen T.L. Osborne 
um, see that we've read about his, his amazing works. You know, they go to places like Africa and, and they pray for thousands of people. And at the end of the meeting, they got this big pile of, of um, walking sticks and things that prop people up. And, and you just get so excited. And yet, in our own land, it's not, not quite so common, people getting healed. But you've got to realize, number one, when he, he goes to a place like that, he, there is an anointing on him by God to walk and operate in the gift of healings. That's, that's where it's God's grace and God's mercy reaching out to the lost to bring them to the knowledge of Christ. And number two is that they don't have any, any other props. If they don't get healed in those sort of countries, they die. There's no backup of the health system that we've got you now. It's good that we've got a health system. What I'm saying is they can't rely on that. They have to rely on the fact that this man has just said, God wants to heal you, and they will grab hold of that, and they get healed. There's many people that enjoy going overseas because they see greater miracles in the lands where there is no, there's no doll, there's no, there's no hospitals, there's, there's nothing there that they, that they can use as a backstop. They have to believe God or they die. And that makes a big difference, doesn't it? So then when it comes to us as Christians, we've been Christians for, say, for a little while, God wants us to grow in the things of God. He wants us to start relying and, and grabbing hold of what the Word of God says and taking it as a truth and not as a, as a oh, well, take it or leave it type of thing. You can't adjust the Bible. The Bible is non-adjustable. Nowadays, we have all sorts of theories of, of we can do this and we can do that. The Bible is not adjustable. The Bible is the Bible. So God wants us to develop our individual faith. I'm going to show you some things this morning that really it was, it was the people who needed a touch from God that just reached out to God and the hand of God touched them and they, and they were healed. Another interesting thing too in my studies is, is that Jesus did not have long prayers. That's right. He did not waffle. He said, be healed. Lazarus, come forth. We would say, get Lazarus, come forth, fifth, sixth, seventh, you know, just keep on going. You see, we, we try to justify when we're praying. Our Lord hath heareth my prayer that this person has, has served on, on the deacon board, or this person has worked in the op shop for so many years, and we go on and on with dribble. That has no, no effect on God whatsoever because God has already given it to us. You don't have to justify it. You're, you, you're, you're made righteous because of Jesus, not anything you do. Nothing you do can make you righteous. But see, sometimes we even... We can even slip into the area of, well, I prayed. That's your work. Now, okay, let's move on, otherwise I'm going to run ahead of myself. <laughs> As we develop our faith and know that we know what the Word of God says, it blows away doubt, which is our biggest problem. Yes. It just blows it out the door. Let's look at Mark 8. Jesus took our sickness at the cross. When Jesus died, he died for our salvation. But he took upon himself all sickness, disease, malfunction, all those things. But here's the good part. We're discussing on Wednesday, Wednesday night. On Wednesday night now, we, we've, we've changed it a little bit. For the first half hour, we have teaching, and in the second half hour, we have prayer. And we find that we're getting lots of discussions, lots of feedback, and, and that's really exciting us as well, because it's, you know, it's, a, it's a time of input as well. So, where was I? Oh, Jesus. Oh, okay. <laughs> the cross. How could you forget that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> when Jesus rose again, there is a, we know in the Bible it says, the spirit that rose Christ Jesus from the dead is alive in us. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So when he rose again, you notice 
that there was no sickness, no disease, he was perfectly healthy. Amen. Is that right? Amen. So therefore, we know that Jesus had all the sickness, disease, malfunction, all those things at the cross. Amen. This is something you'll get more out of the Bible if when you're reading Old Testament, you always feed it through the New Testament and through the cross. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm reading a one-year Bible as well as studies of, of and this morning I was reading about the different sacrifices that people had to make. And I, I was, as I read through it over the last few days, I was saying, praise God we're in the New Testament. <laughs> Somebody blasphemed God, as I was reading this morning. Somebody blasphemed God. So they said, take that person to the outside of the city and stone them. Now, we're not talking about modern-day stoning. We're talking about stone, real brains, you know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And kill them. I'm like, whoa. Isn't that incredible? There was no nonsense in that, in that part. Sacrifices were, animals were dying in their thousands, but sacrifices of people's sin. And I was thinking, praise God for the cross. So anything that's in the Old Testament, must be taken through the cross to the new covenant. Yeah. When we learn that, our lives change. Mm. It changed because no longer can we live under a curse. That's right. Because we're redeemed from the curse. That's right. No longer can we live under condemnation. Like as Dan was here. You know, the condemnation comes. If, if you're doing something you should well, you know, smoking is not a sin as such, it's, it's a sin to your body, but it's not, not something that's gonna Cause your main problem, you know, it's a health issue, right? So when you choose to say, right, I've had enough of this, it is a habit that, that is hard to break. <coughs> but it's so easy to break if you do it not under condemnation, but under knowing that you're redeemed at the cross. For instance, when you light up and you start to take a, I'm doing this for the glory of God. <laughs> and it's not long before you won't want to do that. Then you'll give it up. And that's how people are getting set free, because of God's grace, not, not because of, of the law. Did we ever get to Mark 8? No. Okay, right, we're there now. Mark 8, verse 14. I just want to go through this passage just to build towards what happens in another passage. Okay, so just, just bear with me. Verse 14. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, as Jesus, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned amongst themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. They missed the whole point there, but that's another whole, that's another sermon. I don't want to go that direction. Verse 17. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets of full fragments did you take up? They said to him, twelve. <coughs> also, when I broke seven for the four thousand, how many baskets of full fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. So he said to them, how is it? You do not understand. Now, why I brought this passage out was, as Christians, as time goes on, you will come across many miracles. You will see people, you have miracles in your own life, but I really believe that you will, whether it be financial or, or healing or anything. You, you'll see and you'll hear about miracles and you can go, we've got an awesome thing now, you can go on the net and you can look up areas of miracles that are happening right throughout the world. Awesome things are happening. Amen. This is not being recorded. Amen. Yeah. Good. That's <laughs> what John said. Uh, anyway, <laughs> the, the media's not picking this up. And yet, there's so many awesome things are happening in the body of Christ. People can heal of horrendous diseases. Mm. And so, what I, I'm saying is when something happens, Grab hold of that. Grab hold of that 
testimony of that person that got healed. For instance, when we were, we were in a meeting once in Brisbane uh, with T.L. Osborne, there is something that's imprinted on my heart. It, nobody can take this from me. <coughs> there was a, a man came forward for healing. He had no irises. He had no... What's the, what's the bit in the middle? Pew, pew. It was just white. Just had white eyes. And he got prayed for. And he began to see. He had new eyes in his head. You can't take that away from me. You can't say, oh, that's not for today. That's now part of, of, of my heritage, as it were. So, I, I expect God, he did it for them, he'll do it again. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Amen. I mean, we, we've been, uh, we were involved in, in, in many things, and we know of people that had new lungs, new hearts, and uh, all sorts of parts. On the spare parts up in heaven, you know, we, we've seen that, but it's hard to see lungs. It's hard to see a heart. You hear a testimony. This person, the doctor has said, this person has had this, and this person has had that, and you've got proof, as it were, in writing. But when you're there and you see somebody get their eyes back, it's something. Whoa! This is today. This is not, not in Jesus' day as such. It's now. It's still happening. So there's a, you know, a new excitement, new vibrance in the things of God. Okay, let's move down to verse 23, I think it was. Okay, we're going to start at verse 22. Then he said to, and he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind, a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he restored and saw everything clearly, everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house, neither go into town nor tell anyone in that town. So we see from this particular chapter, in some cases, healing is not instant. We all would love to have instant healings. Boop! That's it. It's done. But sometimes it doesn't happen that way. And from my studies, I found that in many cases, people get healed over a three-day period. Whether that's the death and resurrection, I don't, I don't know what that is. But what, you don't always have to know. If it works, you do it. I mean, how many people know how a car works? Every little bit in a car. You turn the key, all you're interested in is the thing starts and you get to where you want to go. Is that right? You're not going to sit there and think, oh, 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 oh the pistons are going to do this and, and the gearbox is going to... You're not interested in that, are you? No. What color is it? Eh? What color is it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a typical woman, eh? They say, what car are they driving? Blue one. You know? <laughs> Is it a Ford? I don't know. It's a blue one. <laughs> anyway, that's um, <laughs> Now, I'm not saying that if anyone comes in here blind, we're going to spit on their eyes. And, um, <laughs> I'm not doing that. The only good thing about it is because they're blind, they can't see what you're doing. You know, if they had something else wrong with them, just don't go there. Um, <laughs> right, let's go to Mark 9. <laughs> 9.40. So don't always, ex you know, you can expect to be healed instantly, but some people have taken a little while, little by little, and, and we saw one guy in Brisbane in particular, you know, it took a year, and he had a, a serious blood disease, and he got totally, completely healed. By the end of that, his blood count, every month it would go up, or go up, whatever it's supposed to be, I can't remember now what it was, but anyway, by the end of the year, he had a totally clean bill of health. So just because somebody lays hands on you and it's not instant, just relax and go on believing. Little by little, these things are happening. That's good, isn't it? Amen. Okay, that's, um, where did I say 14? Did I say 14? Mark 9, 14. You Mark 9, 14. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. 
Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, What are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered, He said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And he answered them and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. He fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And often he has thrown, thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Then Jesus said, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. The child was immediately set free. Immediately. If you can believe, all things are possible. If you can believe, all things are possible. Now we all know Mark 11, 23. You say, you believe, you receive. And it, some people think that if I pray longer, things will, will break through. Actually, that is in some cases true. But when you go into prayer, it's better to have more of a strong belief. You build your believer up, as it were, then go into prayer, so that when you come out of prayer at the end, you don't think stupid things like, if it be thy will. When you go into prayer, you should know that it is God's will for whatever situation you're praying for. Is that right? You'll have more success in praying if you build your believer before prayer than just rushing into prayer. And sometimes we're inclined to do that. If people truly believe prayer, the meeting on Wednesday night will be more full than the church on Sunday. Is that, is that true? I'm not having to go here. I'm just saying, if we truly believed in prayer, that place would be full. Amen. Because we know we'll be changing our city, changing lives. Right, let's move on to... Well, go, go to 27. But Jesus took him by the hand. We're still on, on that um, uh, lad that had that, that um, spirit being, being delivered. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? Verse 29. So he said to them, This kind can come out by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Now this one, this particular verse for a while, many years ago, really used to bother me. Because we're redeemed from the curse. We walk in the divine presence of God for what Jesus has purchased. And here it says, this spirit won't come out through unless you use prayer and fasting. But as you do a study, you start to come across things that don't quite line up. When the interpreters put it into English, they changed some things because they couldn't quite handle what the actual Bible was saying. Now, I got all the Bibles out yesterday and I spread them all out and I read all the different um, interpretations. And I was surprised. In some, it said, this can come out by nothing but prayer. No mention of fasting. That was in, 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 in a number of um, interpretations of the Word of God. When I picked up the Amplified Bible, the whole verse was written in italics. I thought, that is very interesting. Why is that written in italics? When it's written like that, it means it's been added. What the Word of God actually says is talking about our believing system. This kind comes out. Because we need to believe in the things of God. 
Now, I know that um, many people fast, and I, and I don't have any problem with that if you want to fast. But it says prayer and fasting. If you want to get breakthrough, it does sharpen your spirit a little bit, but <laughs> I think you, you get waves of sharp and, uh, you know. But many people fast to try and persuade God. Fasting won't persuade God. He's already put it down, but what he means is what he says. Fasting is actually done to persuade you. To get you on the track of believing what the word of God says. By his stripes I'm healed. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's what we've been told to do, isn't it? So that's the power that we've got to get in us. Now you can be very... Very humble, a very humble, or, or you think you're humble, in, in, well, I prayed and I fasted and I did all those things, and it still didn't come to pass. The problem is you've got to work on your believing system. Yes, that's your believing system is the thing that will give you breakthrough. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying, if you, if you fast regularly, you go for it. It's good for your health anyway to do that occasionally. But what I'm saying is, don't fast to persuade God, because God's already persuaded. You are the problem. <laughs> That's how to tell you how you look in the mirror and say, you're my biggest problem. <clears throat> it's not the devil, it's not God, you are your biggest problem. <gasps> it's come to that. Now I want to read you something that really, uh, let's go to Matthew 17. Lots of chocolate cakes coming. Yeah. <laughs> Chocolate cake for every time the phone goes off. Man, we're going to have a ball. <laughs> it's too so far. <laughs> Matthew 17. As you can bear it, we'll have banana cake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, in Matthew 17, in verse... Um, start at 16. It's the same story, but it's brought by a different disciple. Okay? So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and he came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Verse 20. So Jesus said to them, the disciples asked the same question, because it's, a, it's a, an account from a different perspective. You know, why couldn't we cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Right. However, this kind comes out through prayer and fasting. That's what it says once again in verse 21. But it's unbelief is your problem. Totally unbelief. Right. Now I want, to, I want to read to you from the Message Bible. Now this is in the modern vernacular as they call it. And this is so cool what they say. It's right to the point. It doesn't work around. At the bottom of the mountain, they were met by a crowd of waiting people as they approached a man, as they approached. A man came out of the crowd and fell to his knees, begging, Master, have mercy on my son. He goes out of his mind and suffers terribly, falling into seizures. Frequently he is pitched into the fire, other times into the river. I brought him to your disciples, but they could do nothing for him. Then Jesus said, What a generation! No sense of God, no focus to your lives. How many times do I have to go over these things? How much longer do I have to put up with it with this? Bring the boy here. He ordered the afflicting demon out, and it was out and gone. From that moment on, the boy was well. What do you think of that? Gives you something a bit more to think about, doesn't it? So this is why I went to that um, chapter to start with on 
They had no bread. They, there were crowds around. They'd already seen Jesus do awesome miracles in feeding 5,000, 7,000, and so, uh, always some left over. And that was, uh, the, the Bible seems to focus on the, the men, but, and it's, it says 5,000 men plus women and children, which means at least 15, 20,000, doesn't it? And yet he fed them all. And he said, you've seen all this, and you still can't grasp the fact that I am a miracle-working God on this earth. Now, Jesus operated out of his deity. When he came to earth, he was God and man, Jesus Christ. Jesus is man, Christ is, is the God part, is the deity part, right? That's why it's quite often you see in the Bible, Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, because it, it, it is focusing man to God, God to man. Now, when Jesus died and rose again, he then was rose again in his humanity, but he had the Holy Spirit that he was going to give to us, so that when we operate, we operate out of a, a humanity, but it's charged with the Holy Spirit. That's where our salvation is. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. So we can do, and the Bible tells us that we can do the miracles that, that Jesus did in a greater measure, because the devil thought he had won, he thought he'd wiped out Jesus. But what he didn't realize, by wiping out Jesus for that short period of time, when Jesus rose up again, he created more Jesuses. He created a massive headache for the Satan. For Satan because now we have all these people running around, laying hands on the sick. See, in the Old Testament, laying of hands meant death. In the New Testament, laying of hands means life. Isn't that right? So here, he's, he's created a problem that he just didn't realize that the scale, that as Christians learn their authority and start to walk in these things, we're going to be a great headache. That's why the devil will have a go at you. He wants to bring you down. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Isn't that exciting? That means that God expects us to lay hands on the sick. He, he commanded us in Mark 18 to do that. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Well, I pray for a lot of people and they didn't get well. Well, the thing is, you keep praying and the, and the Spirit of God is start going to start to flow through you and you will start to see things happen more and more. They increase the more you do it. The more you use those things, like, like Sue shared, you know, those miracles. When you have a miracle, you share that miracle. Actually, it was interesting with, with uh, Bill Johnson how much they put on the area of, um, of testimony. When a person got healed of a particular disease, they would get that person to come out and they'd pray for people with that disease and they'd see lots of people healed because of that. It's a sharing of your testimony, but it's a sharing of the anointing that break that yoke over you that you can release onto others. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. I've never heard of that before and until a few years ago. And, and, it, and it's true, you know. You know. You see, what it's done is it's built your faith. That you know that you know that you are healed. And because you know that, your faith is already up there, as it were. So you can release that, that faith and release that anointing in the, in the, in the gift of healings that, that God will operate through you in those areas. Isn't that, isn't that? That's good. Well, I thought it was good. You know. You're allowed to get excited. You know, you don't have to stay quiet. Okay, well, I hope that's encouraged you this morning. I hope that you can see that your main focus must be on your believing. Now I know from experience that sometimes to get a breakthrough in a particular area, you'll have to go away and pray for some period of time. You may do it on a daily basis. And you need to do that until you get the joy and the breakthrough. And the easiest way to do that is by praying in tongues. Amen. Praying in tongues is the thing that gives you the, I don't like calling it a thing, is the gift that will see your breakthrough. Yes. So, you, you know, you're focused on it, you're praying in tongues. What I love about tongues, most of all, is you can't pray wrong. You may have the gift of praying wrong. 
It's called control or manipulation. But in God, like you know, your son or your daughter going off track, and so you're trying to pray what you want them to be and to do. The best thing is to give them to God and pray in the Spirit and let God take care of it. May not go the way you want it, but God will have his hand on that person and he'll never take his hand off. Isn't that good? See, I can pray for my brother who lives in England or my daughter who lives in England. I don't have to know the details. Lord, I lift up my daughter and I can start praying in tongues and that will go in the Spirit all the way to London. I don't have to go there and spend four or five grand to get there. I can send it by spirit now. It even hits quicker. <laughs> it's instant. And it gets there. It doesn't get lost or missing. It gets there. It hits the spot. Isn't it exciting? That's all awesome. <laughs> Just close your eyes for my Father, we just thank you for this time being able to share your word. Lord, I, I pray that the Spirit of God will encourage and build the people, knowing how much of a grace, mercy, and love you have for them. You're there to encourage them. You're there to change lives for their benefit, not to be a knack, not to be awkward. You're there to get the best out of every person who listens to what the Spirit of God says. So, Lord, we just we give you thanks. And we thank you, Lord, as we go out with that encouragement that we are, we're so full of the Spirit of God that when opportunity comes, we will share the love of God, share it to those that, as you prompt us to encourage others, because this is the only way. There is no other way except Jesus. No other way. But thank you, Lord. If anyone here needs prayer, if you would like like us to pray in the prayer of agreement and please come forward.